Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm your host, Connor Old, and this is the sixth annual Connor's Award Show. The award show I do every single year where I give my thoughts on what I think were the best movies of the year, the best directing of the year, my own little award show. So guys, you've been showing a lot of support for my Oscar videos, as you do every single year, but as I do every single year, I wanted to make my own little award show. You guys often ask me, you know, what are my favorite movies of the year or performances, things like that. And, and sometimes they're Oscar movies, but oftentimes they're not. Many times the Connors Best Picture winner wasn't even nominated for Best Picture. So I have my passions on my own with the lo loving the movies as well as loving the Oscar race. But this is the video that I get to sort of go into and talk about some of my favorite uh, movies in a bunch of different categories, my favorite performances. Check the description below if you just want to see the list of all the different categories and the winners. Um, but stay tuned if you want to hear the explanation and a little bit of analysis and, and really why I love this movie over another. Stay, stay tuned to see if your favorite performer or movie was nominated here at the Connors. I argue the most prestigious award show that there has to be. But this is one that's always a super long video and I'm never great for doing monologues. So rather I just want to jump right into the categories. I've got a bunch of different categories here. Um, sometimes they're similar to the Oscars like best uh, supporting actor, but sometimes they're a little bit different. I have best trailer. I have best moment in a movie, smaller things, different categories I add at, or remove every single year. Um, so I have a couple sort of 2020 specific type ones and that will be a lot of fun too. So let's just jump into it, starting off with the big one, or one of the big ones, Supporting Actor. And the nominees are Oscar Isaac, Dune, Jamie Bell, Without Remorse, Mike Feist, West Side Story, Ben Affleck, The Tender Bar, and Al Pacino, House of Gucci. And the winner is Mike Feist from West Side Story. Now I'd just like to go sort of briefly through some of the nominees before talking about ultimately Mike Feist, in this case my winner. I um, want to talk about Oscar Isaac for Dune. I thought he was just a terrific, symbolic, great father figure um, in a movie that's so long and has so much epic scale and you have to tell so much of the world and the backstory. Very few moments are you allowed to have sort of pure emotion and understand the sort of mother-father son relationship that's going on here and, and Isaac does a terrific job and it really was this sort of iconic, almost kind of Gandalf-like figure I think in terms of his relationship to the Dune in the same way Gandalf falls with the Lord of the Rings. Uh, Isaac's a terrific director, uh, actor and you know even his role in something like the card counter this year was terrific um, so I have to give him mad, mad props this year. Jamie Bell Without Remorse this was a, a movie that uh, not a lot of people saw but I I think he's a terrific actor and particularly his role within the movie and how he plays it. Uh, I'm not exactly sure if you're, he's sort of this slimy corporate guy or if he's actually on the team of, of, of the good guys and then how his character evolves. I think he plays it very well. It's a very difficult role to play off and that was one of those roles where even though I didn't love the movie, he sort of jumped out to me and, and really surprised me just in terms of how uh, terrific he was in this sort of uh, average movie. Then Ben Affleck, The Tender Bar. Uh, this is sort of a, once again another duel award with some of them, something like his performance in The Last Duel. But in The Tender Bar, he plays the sort of uh, uncle figure, father figure to our um, lead character. And he really is sort of this sort of source of, of, of wisdom and uh, of really the most funniest parts of the movie and the sort of wisdom of the movie and life lessons. Um, someone that JR can always uh, sort of come back to and he's and he's got some incredible written dialogue and, and Affleck really sort of takes upon that fatherly figure and uses his charisma and his charm but also showing this man as a, as a three-dimensional person which who has his own sort of faults and relationships but ultimately sort of wants to give this guy the, the best chance that he can um, and then Al Pacino House of Gucci I think a lot of people are sort of overlooking Al in this movie just because he's kind of a, a legendary actor but I love when Al Pacino sort of just goes over the top and, and goes for it and there's some laugh out loud moments with this character more so than Jared Leto or, or the other characters in the movie. I, I was a fan of House of Gucci it's sort of over the top, top campiness and you know there's certain scenes where he's on the phone while he's getting a massage certain instances like that where he just brings so many scenes to life and, and makes it feel real and lived in also feeling sort of uh, blah, blah dedicated to the genre of its sort of campiness in itself. Um, but ultimately, ultimately my winner was uh, Mike Feist for the West Side Story because he was one of those guys where I've never seen before. 
And a lot of that cast of West Side Story I'd never seen before, but when he came out, I was like, wow. Not only did he sort of, in a way, reinvent Riff, this, you know, legendary theater, and then, of course, movie actor with Russ Tamblin, but he did his own sort of thing. I thought he was a little bit more dangerous. He was a little bit more live, wiry, um, and, and antsy, but also there's still a huge beating heart to his character that you could see underneath, that he still feels dangerous when he's with the Jets, but, you know, in his scenes with uh, Tony, he feels like sort of a, a lost kid. There's a, a lot of incredible sort of stuff that he does within the movie, shifting back and forth within scenes, uh, the sort of struggle within his character. And because sort of that main dynamic of Maria and Tony, because it is a sort of Romeo and Juliet uh, narrative, it can only be so emotionally engaging. And I think a large reason why the success of West Side Story still prevails is because of those supporting characters. And I think Mike Feist for me was that standout. He was an ultimate, wow, this guy can do no wrong. And it really blew me away when I saw it. So hopefully he can have a, a terrific career. And Mike Feist in West Side Story is my winner. Now jumping over into Best Supporting Actress, the nominees are Polly Draper, Shiva Baby, Rebecca Ferguson, Dune, Jane Hudichel, The Humans, Gabby Hoffman, Come On, Come On, and Alicia Vikander from The Green Knight. And the winner is Gabby Hoffman, Come On, Come On. Uh, this first one here, Polly Draper from Shiva Baby, a movie that I think a lot of people saw but and, and liked, but maybe didn't necessarily put in their top tens. Uh, I didn't, spoiler alert, but Polly Draper was a terrific uh, actor in this. She was this sort of, she's the mom to the, the main character, uh, and um, she has some great lines, so some of my favorite lines in the movie, uh, like, you know, she was. Uh, she grew up in New York in the 80s, so her gaydar was strong. That, that was a good one. But certain instances like that, and she really does play the sort of motherly figure that does care for her daughter, but also cares about the perception of her daughter to her friends and wants to worry about that too. So she's a little bit self-serving. She loves her husband, but was also annoyed by him at the same time. Polly Draper was just a sort of a terrific comedic performance. And I always like to reward comedic performances when I can, and she was really great. And she was a baby and stuck out to me. Uh, Rebecca Ferguson for Dune, similarly to when I acknowledged Oscar Isaac for Dune. She plays, I think, even more so of, of a leading role because particularly in the second half, it's really her and Timothy Chalamet. And that's the, her connection between her and, and Timothy is one of the main sort of, I think, emotional connections of the movie. And I think the movie has so much visual awe and spectacle, but it wouldn't work without that emotional connection to Rebecca Ferguson and really that character. And because the movie is so sort of interested in so many other things and has to take this complex book and put it into two and two and a half hours, at least the first part, because of that, the emotional scenes aren't as... Um, there aren't as many emotional scenes, therefore having someone like Rebecca Ferguson really sort of invest in it, uh, I thought was, and give enough emotion out of certain scenes and, and utilize those certain scenes very well, sort of efficiently and economically. She was uh, terrific and, and the movie wouldn't succeed without that emotional connection. And she's a, a, a terrific actress who I've been a fan of for a long time. But this may be one of her finest roles. Really uh, impressed by her here. Um, Jane Hui showed the Humans. Uh, the Humans is a movie I really liked as well. Uh, that sort of has been flo floating under the radar, but she's probably more than Richard Jenkins or, or Beanie Feldstein. Oh, the whole cast is terrific, but she's the one that really stood out to me because it's sort of an ensemble role, it's a supporting actor, I guess, piece, but it really is sort of one of the co-main leads and she does a lot of how the story involves and, and how she reacts to that and um, how other characters react for her and she's sort of this constant uh, talking figure, but then what is that talking's trying to hide? Interesting character, and, and Jane, uh, who's a legendary actor, uh, you know, she really based on the play now going and and it's showing us all the sort of terrific performance here on film she really understands his character and, and uh, totally embodies it in my opinion then i have lisa vikander from the green knight the green knight was a movie i was wanting to love but then ultimately didn't love as much as i i, I wanted it to um and but that being said, Elisa Vikander has some of the most sort of significant and piercing scenes from the movie, whether it be her sort of her first half performance versus her second half performance. She has this terrific speech that is just sort of one of the, I think, the one of the core elements and themes of the movie, so sort of precisely done. And David Lowry has had trouble in the past sort of having these great speeches that are so sort of significant of uh, and signif signifying of the movie. I'm thinking of like a, a ghost story, but I think Elisa Vikander getting this terrific talented actress to deliver them. And then also with the fact that how it's being delivered and her sort of 
sexual appeal that she hasn't really utilized since Ex Machina, but also her sort of passion and love. She's a really talented actress, and I really want to see her. You know, because she has sort of uh, not always chosen the best projects, maybe, since um, Ex Machina, but this is a little bit of a return to form for her. But ultimately, my winner is Gabby Hoffman from Come On, Come On. Uh, this is a movie I absolutely loved, and we'll be talking about it a little bit later, so I'll just talk about her performance. But in a movie that would otherwise sort of just sideline her character, she really is a supporting role, and oftentimes will have phone calls, and that's a, a large sort of connection back to the home, that the, she's the mother figure, but she's not there, but she's also sort of connecting and relating to uh, her brother and Joaquin Phoenix, and um, their sort of relationship, and what she's able to do because she's supposed to play the mother figure, but she's also supposed to play the sort of wife nurturing figure, but she's also supposed to play the sort of sister figure. She's doing quite a lot within these different scenes. She's supposed to be this role uh, in many different ways. And then you also understand that within the character, that she's trying to be this, this wife figure and, and help with her husband um, who has mental health issues, but also she's trying to be this this uh, <laughs> a mother to her own son. And then she's trying to be this good um, sister to her brother who clearly there's sort of a, a rocky relationship with because of the death of the mother there's sort of this all intertwined connection and gabby holds that so well and she's able to sort of adjust and free uh, sort of fluctuate between the performances and she was someone that i really didn't know too much about as an actress and similarly to mike feist although she's a little bit older she was sort of came out and, and blew me away and she felt so re real and so lived in and, and, and so natural so material uh, she held her own with a terrific actor like joaquin phoenix and um was is definitely someone that I'm going to be watching out for in, in the future. Okay, then I have this sort of unique category that, that I'm going to do this year, which is I just want to mention a couple of movies with sneaky 2020 releases that deserve love too. Because 2020, there was a move. It was kind of like some movies came in and out, and we weren't exactly sure the release strategy. Some movies just got slept under the rug, and I just want to mention a few of these that I I really liked. Uh, the Empty Man was a terrific sort of. Uh, Zodiac type horror movies mixed with the Slender Man. Really ter terrific uh, directorial deb debut by David Pryor. Long and twisted, but in 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 incredibly engaging. Not since a movie like The Stand Off at Sparrow Creek have I sort of watched a movie and been like, wow, who is this? And what a command of, of the form. Saint Maud was a horror movie that was released by A24, but it sort of got a, a weird um, release. That being said, I thought it, it was really creepy and odd and weird, and, and, and the lead performance was um, so, so strange and, and, and now oddly kiltered. Um, but Rose Glass has sort of her hand on the pulse the entire time, and it's a short movie, but it's an intense movie, and it's a scary movie, and it's an odd movie, and I really appreciated it. And then another way, Freaky, which was a horror comedy kind of a movie with Vince Vaughn, terrific Vince Vaughn performance. Uh, I like the sort of Happy Death Day movies, this was in a way a continuation of that. Um, some odd script choices, but that's what happens when you get us in a scary movie. Self-referential, scary legitimately, but also sort of fun in a th th uh, slasher way. I appreciated Freaky. Then I have another sort of special category that I want to sort of punch out here. And these are movies that aren't really movies, but deserve recognition and, and should be discussed anyway. So these are movies that I liked, but they're not really movies, so I didn't want to put them in any of the categories. And the two uh, nominees and, and winners, really, there's no nominees and winners, but the two winners in this category are In and of Itself and Inside. So the first one, In and of Itself, this is sort of a magic show, filmed magic show by Frank Oz, starring Derek Delgadio. And it's such a sort of linear, story-based, intriguing um, magic show and how they're sort of able to sort of cut through all the different performances throughout the night and interact with the audience and in, in the last part one of the more engaging emotionally experiences i've had this year it's such a sort of interesting experience because it, it, it's a magic show but it's also kind of not and it's also more of a storytelling based show um and it, it's a it's a mystical kind of a, of a world in which uh, derek's is able to do to almost and frank's able to also recapture that um intimacy that you would see in a theater play but then show it to us uh, on film uh, it's a terrific show and, and someone you know that uh, has such a command of their craft on full display here and then inside uh Bo burnham's COVID special. Um, I think there's very few sort of pieces of art that really sort of try to capture the experience of the pandemic as it was happening. However, I think Bo Burnham's Inside probably did a, a terrific job at that, struggling, struggling with uh, mental health, but also bursting with creativity. I think sort of more recent films uh, often fail to 
capture the moment of our time. I mean, just think about how few films are set in the modern era. Where we're had in the 70s, you had movies like Taxi Driver and The French Connection, which were movies about New York in the 70s. Now times, we're still making movies about New York in the 70s. We very, very rarely sort of have uh, American movies that are modern and dealing with sort of modern issues. I think Bo Burnham with his movie Eighth Grade and then with this movie Inside, it feels so prescient, it feels so relevant because he's one of the few artists who actually is trying to engage with social media and reaction videos and the internet and, and how that's having an impact, uh, an impact on us. And it's sort of a comedy special but it's also a film, one man show. I don't know what to call it but if it was a movie it'd be one, uh, one of the best movies of the year on my top 10 list for sure. I was really blown away by it. I, I, I listened to the songs. It's an emotional sort of resident movie it's it's happy it's sad it's depressing it's all of it at once and Bo Burnham really is a sort of singular artist and just to see the sort of amounts of amounts of immense amount of time that he put in, into this sort of hybrid documentary style um, movie comedy, comedy special whatever you want to call it it's uh, terrific and deserving of praise and recognition for sure now jumping over to best animated film I've only got three nominees this year but I do that most of the time and um, just because I want to make sure that even though I have seen more animated features, these are the ones that really stuck out to me. And the nominees are The Mitchells vs. The Machines, Luca, and The Summit of the Gods. And the winner is... The Mitchells vs. The Machines. So Luca, I want to mention here because this was a really sort of nice Pixar movie. I think a lot of Pixar movies for the most part have this sort of... Um, solution-based brain, I guess you would say, in the sense that there's, okay, there's a problem, how do we so solve that? What's the sort of end goal? Um, and then sort of combining that with these abstract ideas, like almost in a way trying to figure out what emotions are like, or uh, your soul, or even in Finding Nemo, it's very much sort of a, a chase kind of a movie, an adventure movie, trying to get to a goal, trying to understand something, trying to solve this emotional problem, where Luca is very much just a hangout movie. Yes, there are sort of themes going out without it, going on within it, but it's a very low stakes movie. The style is very non-traditional Pixar. It doesn't look like a Disney type of 3D animation, CGI kind of a creation. It feels a little bit more uh, moldable and pliable and sort of clay-like as I would describe it. It's a fun hangout movie and, and a beautiful sort of vistas with a great score. The Summit of the Gods is an interesting movie because it almost couldn't be an an it almost could not be an animated movie and just be just as good. That being said, it is a terrific sort of drama about ambition, about climbing, about what your purpose is in life. It's a mystery story about a reporter trying to figure out um, what happened to this uh, legendary mountain climber and his sort of story involves and how he gets intertwined within his life. Um, there's pro it's probably an animation because of this sort of terrific um, mountain climbing scenes that they, they offer and the danger that comes with that, but ultimately sort of uh, maintaining this Shintoist, almost Zen-like approach of, of living your life I thought was very poignant and very interesting and, and unlike, you know, a kid's animated movie that oftentimes are, are, are most, of the, most of the time the animated movies are these four quadrant movies. The Summer of the Gods is a for sure adult drama about a character study about a man and a reporter and how their lives are similar and not really impressed by this one. This one was on Netflix. Also on Netflix though was my win winner, The Mitchells vs. the Machines. What a fun, fun movie. Uh, just a total blast of creativity. The art style, definitely different than the 3D animation. Feels almost like a Sony Pictures kind of comic book-esque in relation to Spider-Verse or something like that. Full of life, full of energy, full of inside jokes for film fans, but also sort of a strong emotional father-daughter, but also sort of familial grouping um, and, and their story and, and coming of age story. Um, the voice performances, Danny McBride, everybody, um, uh, Maya Rudolph, everybody was so terrific, so funny, even you know, surprises from someone like a Conan O'Brien, so perfectly sort of cast in that way, emotional, um, some of the best scenes, uh, humor, action, terrific animation, engaging, one of those movies that you liked at the time and then maybe sort of forgot about, definitely give this one a rewatch because once I gave it a rewatch I was like, man, you know what, The Mitchells vs. The Machines is so creative, so fun, such a, a, a great time, I would want to rewatch it as soon as I ended it, um, and, and such a blast of creativity which I've really been appreciated from these Sony movies in particular. Then I've got here my next category, best moment in a film, which is just a singular moment or scene that I really liked. A couple of them I won't talk so in depth because they are a little spoilery, but I still want to have this for preservation. And my nominees are Nightmare Alley, the ending, Spider-Man No Way Home, the donut shop scene, 
Tick, tick, boom, come to your senses. The Mitchells versus the Machines, Furby slash mall fight sequence. And then finally, West Side Story, the opening. And the winner is Nightmare Alley ending. Oftentimes I like to do endings, but we'll talk about that in a sec. Spider-Man Home, Spider-Man Spider -Man No Way Home donut shop scene is very much, not the ending ending, but pretty much the end scene of the movie. What it sort of tells us about the future of the MCU, I think is terrific. It's, it's an incredible job what Marvel's able to do and Kevin, Kevin Feige's able to do with just setting up whatever the next thing is. I mean, after Infinity War, I didn't love the movie, but at the end I was like, oh my God, what's gonna happen next? They have this incredible job at anticipating and trying to um, predict it and keep you engaged for what's gonna happen next. And the choice made at, at the end of Spider-Man No Way Home, I think is one of the most exciting choices the MCU has ever made. If they sort of carry out with it properly, which I think they will be able to do, that sort of donut sh shop scene it is an emotional core of the movie that I think was unexpected to me and, and will lead to a terrific part of the future. And, and I just want to give credit to him once in a way to how the MCU is so great at giving us that character and giving us that, what's next, what's next, stay tuned, stay tuned. They're terrific at it. Um, tick, tick, boom. Also, also, I want to mention being, you know, a terrific end to the story still. Uh, tick, tick, boom. Come to your senses. This was a, a pivotal part of the movie because uh, Andrew Garfield's character, Jonathan Larson, he's trying to figure out um, the story and sort of song for Elizabeth in his story. And he can't figure out, you can't figure out, and then he finally does it. And this is the sort of showcase of it and the sort of intercut between Vanessa Hudgens' performance and Jonathan Larson's girlfriend performing it within his mind is a terrific sort of powerful bold duet kind of a song uh, that has incredible inner cutting that has a strong emotional power it's emotional because it's the sort of conclusion of we're trying to figure out this Elizabeth song we finally get it but then also ultimately understanding what that came from it and how that art sort of was inspired by Jonathan's personal life that we've been following as well the sort of terrific culmination of, of a scene I was very impressed with um, the Mitchells versus the Machines, the, the sort of Furby mall fight, but essentially as soon as they get into the mall and they realize that all the consumer electronics in the entire mall are coming against them, it's this great sort of fast paced sequence where they're going in and out and dodging, diving and trying to get all these, kill all these sort of um, appliances and they're doing good and they're doing good and then all of a sudden you hear, you know, oh, what is that? And then you hear all these little Furbies, like they're Ewoks and Star Wars, or whatever. And, and you hear chirping. I mean, it almost is sort of filmed like this horror scene. And then we see the giant Furby. Uh, it was just sort of a, 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 a electric moment. It was like, wow, to choose a Furby like that and then have Furbies because it's sort of an electronic, it, but it felt like a, an animal or something, like an Ewok. And, and then for them all to come alive. And then as the camera sort of swoops in and out of them, sort of killing people and being chased by this giant image. As soon as I saw that, I was like, wow, that's a iconic set piece for sure. And, and such a, f probably the funniest and most exciting sequence uh, uh, of, on this list. Um, but also an exciting and interesting and engaging sequence is my next one, West Side Story, the opening of the movie. That opening of the original West Side Story is iconic. And this movie could not beat it because it can't, nothing can beat it, but it came pretty close. And that's saying something. Um, just from the opening, seeing the sort of uh, slums and then the sign of the opening of the Lincoln uh, um, a center and then you know that's what's to come and then off actually the premiere was set in the Lincoln Center but just seeing instances where we move through this giant crane shot and then you open up and and the doors open up and the guys the jets sort of come out and that sort of non-verbal sort of telling the story right away where there's sort of a clear clash and this clash between the, the cultures the Puerto Ricans and sort of the Irish and the whites um, the dancing and the music, of course, but really just the sort of timing of everything. How Spielberg moves his camera and your new shin and the colors they bring. It was all in time with the beat and it was beautiful and it was a sort of symphony of collage of non-verbal pretty much music, dancing, choreography and, and camera movement all in one conjunction and, and dancing with it. I thought it was absolutely terrific. But my winner was Nightmare Alley because it got the most, oh my God, kind of a reaction to me that I haven't gotten in quite some time. If you've seen the original Nightmare Alley, I understand if it uh, wouldn't be as surprising to you, but to me, it doesn't have a twist ending, but it has sort of this terrific, perfect thematic kind of note and, and just how Bradley Cooper plays that scene. And we just, it, the last shot is just a, a hold on him and his performance and his revelation but also sort of acceptance of his his fate and how it's sort of an allusion to a past scene and really sort of 
underlines a lot of the themes of the movie. He ends it with sort of a perfect line and, and we cut to black. It's a sort of perfect, yes, that's exactly how I want the movie to end. There's oftentimes in movies probably one extra scene that we don't need. I almost always want to cut movies uh, 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 earlier than when they actually happened, but Nightmare Alley was the one satisfying. This is perfect. This is the perfect ending. I really liked the movie, but the ending was one of those things where I went just like, wow, no, that's, that, that was it. <laughs> okay, best design here. I have Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar, Cruella, Dune, Nightmare Alley, and West Side Story. And the winner is Dune. So Barbara Star, Go to Vista Del Delmar. We'll be talking about it a little bit later, but that's such a fun, bright joy of a movie. And whether it be sort of the um, Palm Springs Hotel, um, or the uh, Vista Del Mar sort of hotel there, uh, and the musical sequence that happens there, just to the bright colors, so the uh, cheekiness uh, of, of the, uh, and, and cheekiness <laughs> maybe, of the different sort of knickknacks and shops that are going on to the pool and just the resort area felt really lived into the sort of mystical a um, little bit more uh, fantasy crazy villain at lair elements felt realistic too um, beautiful sort of costumes and designs and felt sort of perfectly in tone and understanding of what this movie is uh, Cruella has a sort of great pop punk London um, fuse with Cruella, beautiful sort of costumes and, and makeup and uh, sort of production design even with uh, all uh, it being in, in London, but sort of even just the take of it being a pop punk London, I appreciated Nightmare Alley, that sort of beautiful, really large carnival set that we really explore, feels lived in, feels grimy, feels like it's been traveling, and then when we went when we into the high class area, very different and a great sort of visual metaphor, where much of the movie sort of clean, and pristine, and different from Nightmare, and different from the carnival, and really is a sort of great symbolic element, told through the costumes, told through the production design, very impressive as with m most Guillermo's movies. Um, West Side Story, I think. Beautiful colors and costumes, but also this sort of New York that I felt that didn't feel real. It didn't feel like a real city. It felt like a heightened New York. So it felt in one part like, oh, this is a real street and a real uh, place, but also bigger and, and, and theatrical in a certain instance and feels like a sort of this big built set and even just certain instances like the um, prom dance uh, sequence felt real uh, the, the back door the, the corner shop all of it felt um, lived in and in a place but also theatrical at the same time but my winner went to dune because building that world that's a lived in world that is sort of Denise's vision of what dune is it's this grounded gritty um mm -hmm lived in you know the ships are not these pristine star wars type ships or actually they are a little bit like star wars because they are a bit run down but even more so covered with sand the locations that really felt like a different sort of planet um to these sort of larger vistas of the armies and the militaristic feel of it was very impressive i never for an instance doubted its ability to merge production design with cgi to real sets i wasn't sure what was what and it's one of those movies that you can guarantee will look good a hundred years from now i think because of just how real and, and natural everything fits in and blends in together no sort of cgi elements stick out even the sandworm was just a terrific of course iconic moment from the book and the movies but he is here shown and denise so great with showing us that sort of scale in relation and his whole sort of design and the overall cohesion of of, of the film was, was so terrific then i have here best cinematography nominees are malcolm and marie marcel rev dune greg frazier the dig mike ellie spencer claire Mathon, and west side story Yanush kaminsky and the winner is West Side Story, Yanush Kaminsky. Um, here I have Malcolm Marie, Marcel Rev, which is a movie I think a lot of people you forgot about, but I just love the way uh, um, Malcolm Marie was shot. It feels in a way like a perfume ad or a, a, a clothing company, an Abercrombie and Fitch kind of ad, but I love that because of it. It feels so in love with these bodies and these characters and these performers. There's some beautiful framing within it too, using this black and white, even from the trailer, I was very impressed. I think some people may sort of give it a knock that it looks like a, a perfume commercial, but I'm actually kind of giving it a benefit because I think those commercials look terrific. And to make it look so pristine and, and beautiful, 
and almost abstract in certain instances. I think a lot of people have been praising someone like Bruno Del Belnell for his work in the tragedy of Macbeth, which is great, but I actually think the work here from Marcel was, was really an underappreciated element because it was released in this weird, awkward year. Malcolm Marie, even on Netflix, even though I saw it on this, the small screen, was beautiful. Dune, and Greg Frazier, you have to give some props here just because it's the obvious pick, but also a terrific pick because of long-lasting images of, I'm thinking of Oscar Isaac and this with the army uh, behind them, uh, the Harkonnen, their sort of rows of people, the militaristic elements really connected to me within this movie, um, and, and even just sort of the opening f uh, uh, sand place, and I remember there's sort of like an a influx of, of light, and we have the uh, soldiers sort of glide in at the screen, the, the white sh uh, soldiers that are coming to kill Paul Atreides um, after the sort of attack these beautiful instances of, of balletic almost um, stillness of the camera but movement within the camera uh, great once again at Denis I mentioned at, at showing scale but Greg was able to sort of mix in that sort of realistic element and really do make it feel grounded while also using sort of naturalistic light and, and things like that. The Dig Mike Kelly. Uh, the Dig is a movie that I really liked there's certain parts I really don't like about it, but the movie, parts of the movie that I do like, I really do like. And because you have this sort of interesting, unique handheld camera, it feels, even though it's a period piece, it feels modern. It feels like you can really relate to these characters, which I really felt was, was interesting. Most of the time when we get these period films, we don't get modern camera work. We just get stillness, and that sort of adds to its boringness. But when we get a movie like The Dig, because we use actually this handheld camera, we were able to sort of connect to the characters I felt because we were able to move with them, we were able to sort of see their emotions, see these big close-ups with them, and, and feel that sort of liveliness uh, of the field in a movie that really is just about digging. There's a, a great liveliness to the movie because I think of the cinematography. Spencer Clement almost won here. I think she's a terrific cinematographer and has done great, great work. And here in this sort of pastel film kind of a, of a quality really allows us to understand um, Diana sort of appreciation for this grand world but also her separation from it um beautiful beautiful pastel colors and even just sort of certain dolly shots and tracking of her running and understanding her relationship to the big palace the framing and everything and, and just how it looks that's her sort of filmic grain um was really beautiful and one i'm glad i saw on the big screen and then we have here West Side Story, Yanush Klinsky, which is ultimately the winner because I think this is one of the best looking movies I have ever seen <laughs> and definitely one of the best cinematography winners of the past few years. I saw this one in IMAX and was absolutely blown away by what I saw on screen. The use of colors is bright and it's fascinating. It's not the sort of traditional, I think, Yanush Klinsky pools of light all the time. It is a little bit more bright and exciting. Uh, the way Spielberg moves the camera, but also, of course, that's Yanush, Yanush's uh, specialty in working with the camera operators. Just to have everything in time with the music so many times uh, and so many instances. There's so many beautiful shots. I mean, one of the best shots of the year, I think, is a shot of a, of a puddle. Uh, which is crazy to say, but even just the, the sort of, oh, the shadows of the two uh, teams clashing, there's that image, just the image of the, the, the camera moving towards slowly, um, dying in uh, on the sort of alley scene with uh, Maria, and we see all the sort of uh, drapes and, and clothing, and we can see through it and the colors that are used there. I mean, just beautiful shot after shot. But also, of course, the camera movement, the camera moves within a dance of the choreography. It's almost, in a way, impossible to acknowledge the choreography without acknowledging the choreography of the camera. I think this is maybe Yanush's best work, which is saying something with how many great movies he's ever done with um, Steven Spielberg. But this one really, really impressed me, just of how beautiful it looked. Best first time filmmaker is a category I've been doing for the past couple of years and really enjoying it. So I wanted to mention a few here. Uh, Florian Zeller, The Father, Mike Rianda, The Mitchells vs. the Machines, Josh Greenbaum, Barb and Star, Go to Vista Del Mar, Michael Saranowski, Pig, and Lynn Manuel Miranda, Tick Tick Boom. And the winner is Lynn Manuel Miranda, Tick Tick Boom. Um, so Florian Zeller here drafting his play, The Father. I think I think consider The Father 2020. One movie because it was pre released pretty late, I mean, in the middle of February of 2021, and uh, didn't have actually a, a limited release despite being shown at Sundance in 2020. I still consider it a 2021 movie, and Full Rain, I felt, really showed, like, even though it's 
based on his play, you'd think, oh, okay, it would be this weird play like kind of a movie, but no, it very is it's very filmic. It's very engaging. What he's able to do with the medium and, and put us even more so in the character's mind and how he is in control of that. And this is kind of a complicated, secretly complicated kind of a narrative and, and Florian's able to complicate and uncomplicate it and make it very simple and understandable and, and show much show much, and show so much with illusion rather than dialogue and writing. It feels very much like a movie and couldn't be a play, which is very a testament to his time uh, as a director. So I'm very impressed to see what he what he does next and because I was impressed with this movie. Mike Rianda, The Mitchells vs. Machines, I, I already talked about it. Creative, fun, and you know, someone who has really hasn't worked um, as a director in animation, but I do want to mention animated directors because they're ultimately the, the shepherds of the story. Josh Greenbaum, Barb and Star, Go to Vista Del Mar, one of my favorite movies of the year. You know, I still always think of this as, you know, most of the time, it's got to be a Kristen Wiig and Andy Mumolo, uh movie at its heart because they wrote it, they're starring in it, but to be able to understand their tone and, and bring it to life, uh, I think it is an underrated kind of a, a task, so I had to mention them here. Uh, Mark Michael Sarneski, The Pit Pig, was another movie like The Empty Man in a way with David Pryor where Michael clearly has been wanting to make this movie for, for a long time or has been thinking about this movie for a long time because there's such an intense amount of craft and, and control of the movie that it's very clear that it wants to be, it wants to think, it wants you to think it's one movie and then it very much isn't that movie and that's what the movie is interested in. Beautiful performances he's able to get out of Nicolas Cage and Alex Wolf and great casting of Alex Wolf. I wouldn't have seen him with that but he's absolutely terrific at that and how the story involves and there's never a sort of sense of uh, I don't know where this is going. This is maybe a bad thing. It's always like, oh wow, this is a revelation. And this is the story that it's, it's definitely supposed to be telling, but I didn't expect that. And to have that sort of control and to have that sort of understanding and, and confidence, I was very impressed. But my winner went to Lima Mo Miranda just because I think it's kind of underrated in the sense that I really like Tick Tick Boom and he's a director that you would think would be great because he's such a terrific playwright and, and actor in, in, in his own right, but there's no guarantee that he would have been a great director and he's one of those just uber talented guys clearly because I think of how he sort of edited this movie and his sort of understanding of the medium particularly with that element because of how he knows when to show reaction shots he knows how to move the camera how that all interconnects uh, it's a complicated movie to do sort of Jonathan Larson's life but also the one-man show that he's telling about his life but also sort of these surreal almost uh, musical sequences he knows the musical sequences as well, but he also knows the drama very well. He was able to get terrific performances and linger on the performances and trust those performances. I think it's not a guarantee that he would have been a terrific director. So I'm giving credit just from the fact that he was able to deliver a decent movie, let alone he was able to deliver a really terrific movie, in my opinion, with Tick Tick Boom. So very impressed by what he was able to do and understanding of the form so early on. It's not a surprise because he's such a terrific uh, artist in his own right, but still um, a little bit surprising because he is, you know, a first time director. Here's my next category, best score. The nominees are Come On, Come On, Brian Aaron Desner, Dune, Hans Zimmer, Spencer, Johnny Greenwood, The Summit of the Gods, Amin Buhafa, and Bad Trip, Ludwig Granson. And the winner is Dune, Hans Zimmer. Uh, so come on, come on from Brian Aaron Desner of The National. I talked to, I, I was listening to Michael Mills talk about the, the score and how he was able, not exactly sure what to use and sort of threw out a lot of the score and then sort of found this sort of synth element to it. It beautifully captures the city. Um, it's not a sort of traditional score. It is that synthy and electronic and simple, but also sort of intertwined with sort of piano uh, melodies as well. It's very difficult to, difficult to have a score that works very well within the actual um, songs of the movie too. I mean, there's a lot of songs in this movie, but the score works and, and pairs well, very well with them in its own sort of synthy piano-esque kind of a way. It really captures the sort of heart and the feelings and the sort of beating heart of this movie, which ultimately scores are trying to do. What does this movie sound like? And I think this movie does a pitch perfect job at doing that. Um, Spencer, Johnny Greenwood. Johnny once again shows up here, doesn't win. He's been winning a few years in a row now, but he, of course, is one of our premier composers now, pretty much. He, uh, he does such a unique, interesting element here where he's able to combine jazz, but also sort of other instruments to ultimately capture and display the, um, 
disorienting elements of, of the movie and Princess Diana's relationship to the royal court and the music so much so does emphasize that sort of off-kilter element that Johnny's able to do so well um, and he's such a breath of fresh air because it seems like there's sort of this traditional John Williams-esque almost kind of a orchestral score that we've been riding on for 60 years and now with Johnny he's able to introduce just new instruments that we never heard before to emphasize and, and audiences have been sort of accepting of it and he's a, Spencer's one of those movies like all this a movie to think where if you just listen to the album it works very well on its own right as a piece of music but also works perfectly here once again like I mentioned capturing those emotions and themes of Spencer some of the gods I mentioned is one of my favorite animated films, but I mean Buhafa, I think does a terrific job here with a beautiful sort of piano melody that brings a sort of melancholy, but also the intrigue and thrillery aspects of the movie to life. Uh, iconic certain um, light motifs that are kind of John Williams-esque, but particularly using the piano that was very um, terrific and resonant with me. Bad Trip, Lugo Granson, I had to get it on here. I almost wanted to win because Bad Trip, wait, wasn't that that movie with Eric Andre? It was like a prank kind of movie. Yes, it was, but it was scored by Ludwig Granson and Joseph Shirley. And what they're able to do at, I think, really understand the emotions of the story. That this is still, there's a soul sort of a, a story relationship uh, uh, of these two men, but also with Eric Andre and his sister, played by sort of Tiffany Haddish and their connection. We have all, many times these sequences that are these prank sequences that we have to watch and see, but also there is trying to be this story that's being told. And that being said, you have these sort of small moments where we have to tell the story because we're doing a prank in the next scene and we don't want the movie to be too long. So we have these precious moments of story. And so much of the movie and the emotions are communicated through the music. I mean, there's sort of this great Maria musical sequence, which is, feels like a great musical sequence with a terrific original score, but then also these sort of dangerous sequences when we have Tiffany Haddish, this recurring theme was terrific and it just instantly goes like, oh, within 10 seconds of a score, you're able to so much so add to the character of the movie in such an impressive way. Um, Bad trip if you haven't heard the score. It's definitely a great movie, but definitely works with uh, the, the, the score. But ultimately, the winner was Dune, Hans Zimmer, because of its ability to have a theme for the Bene Gesserit and then have a theme for House of Trades, and then with the, the Fremen as well, and sort of merge it all together and have actually sort of changes and influxes throughout the movie in different scenes. It's almost a wall to wall score. It's always in the background, it's always there telling us about. Whether it's a mention of Bene Gesserit, we have a little bit of a rising of the theme, but then maybe if a, a certain scene will um, mention more of the uh, House of Trades and that emotion and that legency will rise up, so the score will rise up. Even just the sort of uh, 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 vocal work uh, of the score really adds to the sort of mysticism of the movie, I think. and. I think this is one of Hans's real signature achievements. It's one that he's been waiting to do for a long time. And I do think he has a good shot, a shot at winning the Oscar for it. Okay, best trailer. This is a fun one I like to do every year. Uh, the nominees are The Last Duel official trailer, Shang-Chi teaser trailer, Ambulance official trailer, Last Night in Soho official teaser trailer, and Steven Spielberg's West Side Story official trailer. And the winner is Ambulance official trailer. Um, the last dual official trailer was the first one where I was like, wow, is this movie going to be terrific? Because we saw the photos on set and we were like, oh, this is kind of weird. What is this haircut from Ben Affleck and Matt Damon? They're doing this period piece. Uh, this is going to be a weird movie. But then seeing ultimately what it was about and the seriousness and its ability to sort of tell three stories within the trailer and look and show the sort of intensity and brutality of it, but also sort of this core debate and central themes of the movie so perfectly and so I think excitingly in the trailer. The last duel didn't do very well at the box office but I don't think that's the, the problem with the marketing materials in my opinion. Some people had an issue with it but I thought the trailer and the marketing materials were actually very well done. Shang-Chi teaser trailer was this intense pulse pounding two minute not even um, trailer where it was the first look we got it and it was the first movie where I was like I was excited for the movie because the trailer even the the teaser trailer in particular was so great, just his ability to understand and build the world as Shang-Chi goes back to the pool and just starts punching it and we hear the music, it's like, oh, okay, we're back into the seat and you understand and you're communicated so efficiently, like, okay, he's from this world, he left the world, he's going back to it, this is where he's trained. 
This is relationships that are set up in the movie, action-packed. Okay, I understand. So Shang-Chi, the, the teaser trailer, was a real terrific job there. Last Night in Soho, similarly. I saw the movie before seeing anything. I saw that TIFF, so I actually went back to see this teaser trailer. And it's really uh, its own work of art, even the sort of ending transition to its sort of building of the intrigue. Um, this was a movie that also didn't do maybe light up the box office. The, it, no movie really did sort of light up the box office necessarily this year, except for some superhero movies. Um, but last night in Soho, even though I had already seen the movie, I watched the trailer and I was like, oh, that's an accurate representation. That's probably the best way to show this movie um, and, and felt like so creative, so original. And then that's uh, Steven Spielberg's West Side Story official trailer. This is the trailer that um, I, you still probably saw in a lot of movie theaters that I saw oftentimes and I was very engaged by it because it sort of s starts with the two night. Um, by Rachel Zegler, Maria, Rachel Zegler's Maria, in that sort of building of, of her, and then showing these different scenes and cuts and almost a sort of a montage of some of the most beautiful elements of the movie and sort of core themes of like, we don't like those people, that's the understanding. Um, perfect choices of dialogue and building of the music to be like, wow, this is West Side Story, this is a big epic movie, which it ultimately is. But my winner was Ambulance, because I really do like these trailers, like Tenet last year, the year before, that are a couple of years old with Mission Impossible Fallout. These sort of pulse-pounding trailers really get my blood moving and really appreciate. And Ambulance was definitely one of those. Starring Jake Gyllenhaal, it was one of those movies where once you have the revelation of, oh wow, this is a movie about guys who are robbing banks, which is pretty traditional, and then you have to realize the fact that, oh wait, this is actually a movie about they're in the ambulance with a dying cop, so there's a chase movie, so they can't get them. I was like, wow, what a creative sort of conceit. Michael Bay really understands how to move the camera and it create exciting action, and that was all boiled together to this trailer. Even if the movie isn't terrific, I'll be there day one for Ambulance. All right, this is another fun category I like to do called Best Small Part, which is the sort of not a supporting role, but smaller than that, sort of a cameo, but maybe a bigger role than that. Maybe the Dion Waiters Award, kind of, if you want to refer to rewatchables. And the nominees are Blue Bell of the Chihuahua from Cruella, Weasel slash Sean Gunn from The Suicide Squad, Ana de Armas from No Time to Die, Jeffrey Wright from No Time to Die, and M. Night Shyamalan from Old. And the winner is... Bluebell the Chihuahua from Cruella. Um, here I have Weasel, played by Sean Gunn in the Suicide Squad, although he is mostly just a, a noise machine. <laughs> he is sort of this guy who is this strange, odd, weird, antsy figure that we see at the opening in, in Suicide Squad that does so much with so little. On the armor from No Time to Die, if we're wondering where the future of the Bond franchise should go, I think it should go in the direction of On the Armors and No Time to Die fun, kind of campy, old school spy movie. It was this great sequence in this otherwise serious movie that was like, wow, this is a burst of fresh air. She is so terrific in it. And she's like, hey, okay, I'm here and I'm gone and bye. And I look stunning and I look beautiful and I'm funny. Wait, why aren't we going with her again? Anyways, Jeffrey Wright from No Time to Die almost won this category just because I almost forgot that he was in Casino Royale. And then when he appeared in this movie, with so little scenes, and even without my full understanding that, oh yeah, he was in Cocina Royale, and he was sort of a, a appreciator of Bond, because Bond doesn't really have that sort of lineage within the movies. It's just the connection between, you know, he, he, in this movie, is sort of a connection with Leia Sidhu and the conclusion of the story. But Jeffrey Wright, in his small scenes, was like, immediately able to connect with uh, uh, Daniel Craig and be like, hey, we know each other, we're friends, do this for me as a friend, and have this already long-standing history that we don't really see a lot of, but immediately buy into because of his performance here, just that connection to build that friendship. And then M. Night Shyamalan for, M. Night Shyamalan for old. It's always fun to see him in, in his own movies, but I think this is maybe his best cameo because he's literally the sort of person, in the case, in this case the bus driver, taking the people to the, at the beach, taking us, the audience, directing us to the story, to the beach, and then how it pays off in the end. Uh, I thought it was really uh, fun too. But the winner was Bluebell the Chihuahua from Cruella. Uh, this is the character of Wink. And this dog is so fun, so funny. <laughs> it was the reason why I really liked Cruella, just because every time I saw Wink, I was like, I need a, a spin-off movie of, of uh, him. Uh, so funny, so creative. It's such a, you know, even Emma Thompson sort of joked about him um, stealing her light. 
and one of those guys that uh, dog performances that was just so fun and cute and heartwarming and uh, perfectly trained too and um, Wink w was an emotional connection to me and, and to the movie for sure and I had to give him his shout out um, best ensemble here is my next category I have House of Gucci Dune Leckerish Pizza Spider-Man No Way Home and No Sudden Move and the winner is Spider-Man No Way Home uh, House of Gucci here, whether it be Jerry and e. Irons or Jared Leto or House of uh, or Al Pacino, Adam Driver, even they're all doing their own kind of little performances within this larger campy movie. But I think all do their own great job. Jeremy Irons is almost vampiric kind of a, a character. Adam Driver's in this very serious, straightforward kind of movie. Lady Gaga's in this big, dramatic movie. Jared Leto's is pretty pretty much in a, a Waluigi movie. <laughs> I mean, it just so much, so much fun, and they're all great in their own way. Dune, um, whether it be someone like Stephen Henderson, the small part, to even someone like Timothy Chalamet, I mentioned Rebecca Ferguson and Oscar Isaac. They're all sort of pitch perfectly cast in their roles and given not a lot to do with, but do a lot with that regardless. Licorice Pizza was another one where it's like, whether it be Tom Waits or Sean Penn or the great sort of little sequence of Bradley Cooper, where I think the sort of two leads of. Uh, Cooper Hoffman and Alana Hyam. So electric, so exciting. A great ensemble. I think they're all terrific in their own lived in ways, whether it's the craziness of the adults of the movie or John Michael Higgins, who gives a funny mo moment there, to the realism of the leads. Uh, Electric Pizza was a movie that uh, definitely this ensemble connected with me. And then No Sudden Move, the Steven Soderbergh movie that was released on HBO Max that people always underrate and forget about Soderbergh's movies, but I don't. Or at least I try not to. And No Sudden Move is this complex layer labyrinth of a movie. But it's got some of the best performances from Don Cheadle, Benicio Del Toro, Amy Simons, David Harbour. I mean, the, se the sequence where David Harbour sort of freaks out in his office, or Amy sort of motherly figures, uh, motherly figure early on in the movie, or Don Cheadle, and even the surprise cameo later on, which I don't want to spoil. There's a stacked cast, but all really perfect and giving these sort of humanist double crossing but so grounded um, performances but the winner is spider-man no way home i'm gonna say it because if you haven't heard it by now you haven't been paying attention but it's a spoiler for the movie so do note that <coughs> but in the movie we see andrew garfield his spider-man we see toby mcguire spider-man come through the multiverse and come into our tom holland mcu spider-man and not only are they sort of cameos one moment but they're actually full-on characters and for the second half of the movie they're in it and they're fighting and they have their own scenes and preparation scenes and emotional arcs and just because of that conceit because they were able to get all three spider-mans together i thought was brilliant and then also let's not forget we have academy award nominated actress uh nominated actor willem dafoe academy award winning actress marissa tomei uh, john favreau is terrific and even zendaya and um jacob Batalon playing ned and mj so many emotional connections to the story and because the movie, even though it has so much to do, it would just feel like still a grounded Spider-Man story, more so than it is MCU. I mean, Benedict Cumberbatch, Oscar nominated as well, just because of that sort of central conceit of those three guys, but also that supporting cast, I just think it's sort of been underrated and how perfectly cast it's been, an emotional conclusion to the sort of three Spider-Man movies that we've gotten in a great way, and I have to recognize it's sort of great performances across the board, so I want to do so here in Ensemble. Best screenplay now, the nominees are Barb and Star go to Vesta Del Mar, Kristen Wiig and Annie Mumolo, Pig, Michael Sarnowski, the, the Card Counter, Paul Schrader, The Worst Person in the World, Joaquin Trier and Eskel Vogt, Come On Come On, Mike Mills, and the winner is Barb and Star go to Vesta Del Mar, Kristen Wiig and Annie Mumolo. Um, here I have Pig, Michael Sarnowski is one of my nominees. I love the movie, but I really love the screenplay because of its revelation, because of how it seems like it's a John Wick revenge movie. Nicholas Cage has got to get his pig back, but it's actually not. It's actually much more humorous. It's actually much more a story about grief and trauma and how you sort of manifest that and relationships with fathers and sons and what your passion is in life and, and going for that and the art of, of food. Uh, there's so many elements here where 
very much is the conceit of one movie but actually becomes something else and it, that's the reveal and its structure and how it reveals about the screenplay was, was, was totally surprising and absolutely engaging to me. Uh, the Card Counter, Paul Schrader, one of my favorite movies of the year, frankly, and Paul does a terrific job here once again at bringing the interiority of his movies to life of this guy who is a wanderer, who is a samurai figure of a sort, who moves through Concedo Casino throughout the country making money because that's the only way he can, at being an ex-convict and, and suffering for his sins of his past in, in Abu Ghraib. Oscar Isaac does a terrific job at sort of collecting those thoughts and emphasizing those thoughts, but Schrader, some of the best dialogue and words and poetic and everything. Schrader's one of the best screenwriters living still, and the card counter is another notch in his already impressive resume. The worst person in the world, Joaquin Trier and Escovote. Escovote is his own terrific director, even though Joaquin directed this one. They've done five movies together now, and worst person in the world. Unlike certain uh, American movies that are so obsessed with how great it was to grow up in, in the 70s, The Worst Person in the World is actually a movie that's interested in today, and really is living to not to, in today, in about a person that doesn't really know w what direction her life is going. Having these sort of honest, kind of a ro rom-com, romantic drama, and then ultimately sort of being this self-reflective movie about life and, and their meaning. and. Great performances from everyone around, but that stems from its screenplay. Super glad it got nominated for Best Original Screenplay at the Oscars. Definitely deserved, and the conversations here and, and the reality situation never feel like a movie. You always feel lived in and real and experienced, and, and totally something that's worth uh, appreciating. Come on, come on, Mike Mills. I almost went to this one because it has such real lived in dialogue but also it's hard to give it to its screenplay because a lot of it was improvised on the day which is why it feels so real and lived in and, and accurate to the reality and emotional kind of raw feelings just being spurted out so i wasn't actually sure how much he wanted to award mike mills for his screenplay but we'll talk about come on come on a little bit later the winner ultimately being barb and sargo to miss del mar because this is an incredible screenplay and chris and wig and any momolo to me are, of course, the stars of the movie, but also the screenwriters, but they seem like they are the main creative force of this movie. After Kristen Wiig and Annie Momolo got Oscar nominated for their huge comedy hit, 2011's Bridesmaids, you may be wondering, hey, why haven't they written another script? What's, shouldn't they have a blank check? Well, this is their blank check. This is their next script and this is what they want to make. And it's a wild, crazy, funny, but totally unique. I, the best, I heard a letterbox review of it, which I think was a best encapsulation of it, which said, this is like a Muppet movie with real people, which I think is an absolutely perfect way of, of describing the movie. So fun, so full of life. I hate to see it that everyone sort of agreed with this terrific movie and it never showed up on anyone's top 10 list. I hate when that happens. I'm a big fan of comedies. I want to reward comedies. This was one of the funniest comedies. This was the funniest comedy of the year, one of my favorite movies of the year, and um, it, it's small moments of Morgan Freeman as a crab to its sort of ending, uh, uh, and I, that I don't really want to spoil, but even the different sort of conceits of Jamie Doran's character and and um, the relationship with Barb and Star and um, their lines of dialogue are just absolutely hilarious. Some of it I'm sure is improv, but a lot of it because it's so creative, because they had to sort of do that stuff in advance, even in just the general conceit of Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar and why Vista Del Mar. And it's such an intense amount of creativity and joyfulness. And I'm so glad that this movie just got made. <laughs> Here we go. Now to the big categories. Best Director, Mike Mills, Come On, Come On, M. Night Shyamalan, Old, Denis Villeneuve, Dune, Steven Spielberg, West Side Story, and Paul Schrader, The Card Counter. And the winner is... Mike Mills, come on, come on. Um, so, let's go with M. Night Shyamalan for old here first. I'm a big M. Night Shyamalan fan. For his downs, he also has high ups, and I think his sort of career trajectory comeback since the visit. It still continues on with old, I think old, what he's able to do with the camera is certain elements where you go, I don't even know how he did that. Um, his ability to really appreciate and sort of commit fully to this B-movie kind of a premise, but then add such a level of technical craft and true pathos and emotion to the storytelling is incredible. The ensemble cast of characters and performances you get from that, great, but really his command of the story. that. 
I never know where it's going to go. The fact that you know it's going to be some sort of twist ending, which you don't care anyways, because of the story that's being told along the way. Like I said, what he's able to do with a sort of stop, slow motion camera, or he's able to sort of communicate the themes of the camera, of, of this losing time, of sort of dividing family, told through in interesting choices of like showing it, um, the, the fight through uh, characters, uh, uh, sort of action figures of, of toys of the kids, how they grow up, the fears of that, the antsiness of it. Even though it's in, set in one location, there's so many different uh, elements and camera movements and, and, and angles that he's able to bring from it, and they all feel distinct and recognizable, and I understand the jury that's going on. And even certain directorial choices of like not putting on super old makeup at, at the end for the characters was like a perfect little choice, and, and, and ultimately how it ends. Some people didn't like the ending, it probably goes on for a little bit too long, but if you do sort of appreciate it as what we'll call it a graduate-esque ending without spoiling anything, I think it is an absolutely per pitch perfect way to end that movie. I was really impressed by old and I met Sean Lon. It was clear, it was like, wow, this is his movie. No one makes movies like him. Even if you don't like the dialogue or whatever, it's like, that's how he makes movies. So if you don't like it, hey, you don't like it. But I like it. Denis Villeneuve for Doom, you have to recognize this tremendous achievement of, like I said, blending. All, I gave all these awards, ensemble, score, but guess what, who's the director? Even though Denis didn't get nominated, which is the biggest snub, I think, in, in the Oscars this year. At the Oscars, you know, he got nominated here for the Connors because of what he's able to do, blending the elements of the production design and the visual effects and merging that together, but also bringing the scale, the cinematography, but also sort of showing us that score and when to use the score and when not to work, but using the score all the time and that performance he was able to get out. And just building this world and this story and this complex, great book that we never really thought would be filmable is now filmable, at least in these two parts. Denis is one of our premier directors and he had to get nominated here for one of his signature achievements. Steven Spielberg for West Side Story, once again, another sort of element that's been nominated a couple of times where I mentioned Yush Kaminsky, but also it's in part West Side Story. Success is in part, of course, Spielberg because of how he moves the camera, because his instincts, because of how he's able to choreograph with the uh, movie just to get great performances out of newcomers rachel zegler i the boys mike feist uh so many of these wow 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 performances he was able to get out it seems like he's directed musicals his entire career even though this is his first musical the way the camera moves makes sense like a spielberg way but also makes sense in a musical way is not static is not sort of different it's different than west side story but also pays a homage to the original the camera work here it's such a display of mastery of craft. He knows exactly where to put it. What he does with it, it's, it's almost unspeakable. West Side Story was one of my favorite movies of the year. And even though he's going off the sort of traditional structure, I think what Kushner was able to do is to sort of highlight themes and connect them back to today was relevant. And um, Spielberg is the orchestrator of it all. And he's one of the greatest directors of all time for a reason. Um, and then I have Paul Schrader for the card counter. I mentioned his screenplay, but I also don't want to mention his, it, I also want to mention his director. Uh, focus as well. He has a, a very specific type of movie, you know, even the digital photography, which I don't really like in something like First Reformed, I really do like in this movie because it makes sense where casinos, if you see it in a movie like Ocean's Eleven, don't really look like that. They look like this movie. They're dimly, weirdly, sort of, they're not dimly light, they're sort of brightly lit, uh, uh, luminescent LEDs with that kind of hurt your eyes, that make you sort of stay up and gamble all night, which is kind of the reason there's no clocks. What well, he's able to do it at capturing this kind of conference-esque element and approach to casinos because it is like a job really well done. Um, and of course his relationship to the screenplay, but also his performance out of that central lead of Oscar Isaac, making sure he understands the character, understands the story, <coughs> and then communicating that to us. But also there are some secretly um, beautiful shots as well to this movie and how it sort of unfolds and never gives away and shows its hand, pardon the pun, um, so well done. But the winner is Mike Mills for Come On Come On. One of my favorite movies of the year, maybe my favorite, we'll talk about that later. But Mike, was he, what he's able to do here is, you know, oftentimes his movies have been claimed to be sensitive, um, but I think they're very perceptive. Uh, this feels like a real life movie that feels like real life people, which in, it involves um, and, and looks at the relationship between a child and, and, and a father-like figure. And if you're not interested in the child performance and that kind of main thing, you may not like this movie. But I think what Mike is able to do and his sort of approach to filmmaking in general, whether it's the beautiful black and white cinematography, whether it's sort of insightful um, montage-esque sequences of, of the reading of the books, he's able to really understand 
and bring something new where Steven Spielberg in a way is doing classical storytelling that he invented. Mike Mills is trying to do something new. He's trying to show that there's a different way to make movies, that there's a real emotional connection to improvisation or and to telling stories that's just about people and going from city to city and interviewing people and trying to have the sort of head front confrontation of life. Such a command uh, of the, the art form and, and an almost a different kind of art form with Come On, Come On. One of my favorite movies of the year and has to be well respected to, to Mike for what he's able to do just to create this environment, to create this movie that feels lived in and feels real and feels authentic and feels emotionally honest. Okay, best lead actress the nominees are Lady Gaga, House of Gucci, <coughs> Carrie Mulligan, The Dig, Agatha Roussel, Titan, Kristen Wiig, Barbara and Sargo to Vista Del Mar, and Renate Renzve for The Worst Person in the World. And the, and the winner is Kristen Wiig, Barbara and Sargo to Vista Del Mar. So Lady Gaga, House of Gucci. Like I mentioned, I, I like the cast of House of Gucci and what she's able to do here, playing this sort of sexy, but also intelligent, but also ambitious, but ethically, you know, irresponsible uh, figure. Rise to power, fall from grace, classic kind of using her movie star charm and charisma in a great way. Loved Lady Gaga in this. Uh, Carrie Mulligan, The Dig. She plays a sort of more elderly-esque figure in another movie, but brings it with a sort of youthful vitality in this sort of motherly figure of the entire movie. Of course, trying to help bring along the right people, but also protect Basil Brown, but also dealing with her own illness and trying to keep together her family. Carrie Mulligan is one of our pr most promising young actors and great actors, really, um, whether it be Promising Young Woman last year or Wildlife in 2018, even all the way back to an education. She is one of those people that you have to consistently respect and appreciate, which I do. Renate Renzve from The Worst Person in the World. If you like the movie, you most likely like her. When a movie that could have been sort of a Francis Ha type knockoff with a sort of wandering th direction less sort of 30 year old makes a more sort of humanist and empathetic portrait of her than I've ever maybe seen. The way she approaches sort of lack of maybe logic but also emotions, how sometimes she feels like the, the worst person in the world because of the sort of poor decisions that, they, that she makes but ultimately that we still connect with her, that we still understand why she's so appealing because she's so beautiful but also she's so funny and smart and, and has this warmth to her uh, perfect sort of age even where she's a little older so the actor can look back on that time. I think it is a, a, a terrific role for her and like I said if you like the movie which I do, you like her. Agatha Rousseau from Titan is a wild performance in a wild movie. She plays this sort of uh, <laughs> man-like figure, but also of herself, but also just kind of like a serial killer, but also is just looking for family. It's a sort of animalistic movie and she gives an almost animalistic performance in its sort of connection to uh, the, main, the, the sort of main father figure there of the movie. She's always alluring and sometimes sexy, but also scary, but also physically demanding. Uh, what a strange kind of performance and a strange thing to, to, to ask from her. And what she does and sort of bending those gender lines, I thought was, was so really well done. But the winner is Kristen Wiig. I try to nominate comedic performances when I can. And I wanted to also nominate someone like Annie Mumlow, but this is really sort of a, a war for the both of them. But I went to Kristen just because she has that sort of a uh, villain role too. Um, perfect kind of a role here playing star. She has the villainy kind of a role where she's playing opposite Jamie Dornan and um, almost recognizable. Uh, and um, she plays this sort of lack of affection, very fun f funny and sort of over the top evil villain character terrifically. But also then a star is this sort of warm uh, person who really loves her friend Barb and is very funny, but also has her own desires and needs with maybe Jamie Dornan. Ah, tough to say. Um, Regardless, a, a terrific comedic performance and I had to reward it somehow, so I went with Kristen Wiig. Um, then we have here Best Lead Actor now. I have Lakeith Stanfield, Jews and the Black Messiah, Andrew Garfield, Tick Tick Boom, Bradley Cooper, Nightmare Alley, Benedict Cumberbatch, The Power of the Dog, and Joaquin Phoenix. Come on, come on. And the winner is... Lakeith Stanfield, Judas and the Black Messiah. So, Andrew Garfield, Tick Tick Boom, what is he able to do? 
not only can he sing and dance, but more so what he's able to do with the emotions, bring out the emotions within that song. I'm thinking of the scene where he's playing the piano in the park, singing about Michael after learning about his diagnosis. Really emotional, moving scene, but also very funny. You understand that Jonathan Larson was this sort of larger extrovert, sort of larger than life uh, party kind of a figure. And we understand his struggle though. This is not the story about rent. This is the story about him trying to make it, which I think is very uh, interesting. So the varying levels of Garfield as a performer and bringing out Jonathan Larson's interiority, whether it be his struggle to make great art, whether it be his trying to manage the relationship that is no is not going to work, whether his relationship with Robin De Jesus's character, uh, uh, an overall just masterclass in, in juggling all those things and showing that emotion and revealing that to the audience without revealing it necessarily to the other characters and feels real and lived in within the scene. Bradley Cooper and Nightmare Alley. I think a lot of people saw the movie and went, oh, this should have been Leonardo DiCaprio or something. No, it shouldn't have. You know, he's done that before. This is a perfect for Bradley Cooper because I think it's a perfect Bradley Cooper role because Bradley is not a Leo. He's maybe close to him, but he's not in that necessary legendary status. He's still the sort of theater kid that wants to be this great actor that's willing to try hard and he's really kind of passionate about it. And you can see that through, I think, in a lot of his performances. And I think this works well here for Neymar Alley about this guy who is intensely ambitious, but not necessarily unsure about why he is so ambitious, not necessarily sure why he wants to be that ambitious, just that he has that drive and he knows exactly, he's not exactly sure where he wants to go, but he knows that he wants to start a new life and because he's in this area, he wants to sort of expand regardless, uh, carelessly without regard. Um, and, and Cooper, particularly like I mentioned in that last scene, is so terrific. And it gives one of the best performances, I think, in his career. I think is a classic Bradley Cooper showman, insecure kind of uh, manipulative performance. Great character and, and a great performance. Ben and Cumberbatch, The Power of the Dog. Him, him playing Phil is the sole center, I think, of this movie. Intense, intense, fascinating, hard to pin down. I think Ben Cumberbatch's Batch's best performance because of what he's able to do without the dialogue, how he walks, how he carries himself, the sort of interiority, the sort of masculinity that's cracking at the seams in the sort of smaller moments, but also in the showier moments, how he sort of reacts to his own feelings and, and manifests, manifests that and, and the softness that he actually does show sometimes in the movie. A range of uh, emotions so well done by Benedict. Well, in Walking Phoenix, come on, come on. What he's able to do with the changing of, the, uh, of his character of going from and walking going from a movie like the joker to what well, come on come on to be this sort of fatherly figure who's honest who's not this sort of strong masculine necessarily type he is a supporter though he is a terrific man but he's also honest about himself and he's honest about his struggles and he communicates those struggles and his frustrations but also sort of his his goofiness it's all there on display and, and walking makes this feels like a real life person. But my winner is Lakeith Stanfield, and frankly, it's not even close. Even, the, even though this category was so difficult to narrow down in terms of its nominees, the winner was always clear since day one. Lakeith Stanfield and Juice and the Black Messiah, which I think is maybe the best performance I've seen this century. I mean, I put it up with Daniel Day-Lewis and There Will Be Blood and Amy Adams in Arrival. It is the reason why I like the movie. It's almost the reason why I don't like the movie because it's not enough of a focus for him. Despite Lakeith getting nominated Best Supporting Actor, which is a sham at the Oscars, he's the lead of this movie. Um, he gets nominated and wins here for lead at the Connors. A sociopathic borderline kind of a role. We're never privy directly of understanding what Bill's motivations are, but we know intensely, in my opinion, through the character and through the performance of Lakeith Stanfield. And he did such a great job here because it's an interesting character, but it's not totally commun communicated to the audience exactly what it is. But I think Lakeith, through his performance, is communicated exactly what we need to understand. His sort of struggle of being friends with Fred Hampton and in the Black Panthers, but also having this sort of looming, sinful kind of a weight over his head, knowing that he's lying to them and is an FBI informant. and doesn't want to go to jail and he was a young kid when this happened and that kind of betrayal uh really judas as as the main character understanding his motivations through lakeith stanfield's performance i think is so underrated and so well done lakeith stanfield for juice and black messiah wow 
All right, here we go, best picture. And I got 10 nominees, and not in any order, but I will get a winner. In alphabetical order, the nominees are Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar, Come On, Come On, Nightmare and Alley, Old, The Card Counter, The Mitchells vs. The Machines, The Worst Person in the World, Tick, Tick, Boom, and West Side Story. And the winner is Come On, Come On. Uh, you may have thought with the Mike Mills nominate win and the Gabby Hoffman win. I really, you know, we'll talk about that in a second. Let's just go through the nominees. Barb and Star, Groove of Still Tomorrow. I mentioned such a creative, fun, uh, joyful movie. Uh, funniest movie of the year. Dune, massive, epic scale. Beautiful sort of creative fantasy sci-fi story. Epic in every sense of the word. Nightmare Alley, a sort of dark, twisted, in intensely, I think, cynical approach at what humans are willing to do. And that being the true horror of this movie was really sort of a terrific uh, experience in this sort of modern day noir. Old was a fascinating, intense thriller from direct command from M. Night Shyamalan in the way that was some of the most beautiful camera work, framing, and performances I've seen this year. The Card Counter, Paul Schrader's intense, sinful, uh, samurai kind of a movie with intense interiority, with intense complex moral ambiguity, and what it means to live a good life. The Mitchells vs. Machines, alternatively, alternatively, a really fun, exciting movie that was uh, just a total blast and a great, fun animated movie. The Worst Person in the World, fascinating look at kind of a romantic comedy about a woman in, in, in her 30s living her life, but then turns into a drama, then turns into a study on relationships and passion. Intensely personal, intensely emotional, intensely resonant. This is a movie I saw relatively recently and could rise in my rankings. Tick, Tick, Boom, what, censored by a central performance from uh, Andrew Garfield. He really is able to sort of mix music and uh, passion for creativity and building art into something that is relatable to all. And West Side Story, Steven Spielberg's reinterpretation and remake of the 1961 classic based on the play of the same name. What he's able to do in this camera work is some of the best he's ever done in his career. Great performances from a whole terrific cast of young actors and beautiful colors with, of course, the classic songs. But the winner was Come On, Come On. And uh, like I said, you may have mentioned it, sort of saw it earlier on. But to me, there's every once in a while a movie that it clearly your number one. You watch it and you go like, oh, that's the best movie of the year. And that was it for Come On, Come On. It's one of those life-affirming movies. It's one of those movies that you, oh yeah, that's why I watch, this year I watched 70 movies that were released in 2021. It's like, that's the reason why I watched 70 movies for, for this award show. It's because I could find a movie like Come On, Come On. Uh, I don't really care, you know, stuff like about the Oscars in a certain way. I care a lot because I'm interested in the race and I like that element of it. But in terms of what gets nominated for Best Picture, I, those movies never totally are my favorite movies of the year. Movies like this are my favorite movie of the year. Uh, movies that are emotionally honest, that aren't necessarily interested in the intellectual puzzle solving of something that feel like um, a whole different medium that are reaffirming in, in life, in building relationships, in understanding humanity. All of that is exemplified here in Come On, Come On. I like it in movies when we have these sort of montage sequences and what Mike is able to do, particularly with sort of poems and how he's able to sort of interwork that with telling us the, the, the true story of the movie and the sort of flashbacks and the, combined with the music and the narration. It's just this sort of cumulative kind of storytelling. I don't really know what to call montage, I guess, kind of a sequence, but different than that that became so resonant, you know, one of those movies that you, it's impossible not to cry at at every instance because it's just how beautiful it makes life seem. And it really is one of those life-affirming movies. Come on, come on, if you haven't seen it, I think it's the best movie of the year. But that's about it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Comment below, let me know your favorite performances. If you stayed this long, picture of the year, director, all that stuff, I'd love to hear it. I appreciate the support you guys have been showing me. Please do continue to show that support here. That's about it. Until next time, stay tuned.